Hi everyone, I'm Mitzi from the Philippines. Sophia, you're on mute, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, oh well, my name is Sophia, I'm from Costa Rica and welcome to our third week of Tax for Future webinar. So today we will be learning about the impacts of climate change on small Pacific nations. So for our first speaker, we have Jerwin Baure from the Philippines. He is the chairperson of Alhamdulillah, an organization of science professionals that advocate for making science and technology serve the people. He's a Fisher Folk rights activist, an environment activist, and he took up his Bachelor of Science in Fisheries at the University of the Philippines, Visayas, and his Master's in Science in Marine Science at the University of the Philippines, Diliman. He is currently a research associate in science in studying the effects of ocean acidification and warming on benthic diatoms. Our Hello. second guest, sorry. Hi. Well, our second guest is Carlo Manuel. He is a member of Earth to Our Oceans. He is one of the 16 child petitioners of the Children versus Climate Crisis along Greta Thunberg, who filled the complaint to the Convention of the Rights of the Child last September. He, he is also from the Philippines, but he moved to Palau nine years ago. Carlos first learned about the climate crisis in ninth grade, and he began to understand that the changes that he had noticed in Palau were part of a bigger and global phenomenon in caused by the climate crisis, including increasing temperatures, rising sea levels, and more <clears throat> extreme storms. Actually, in November 2013, a super typhoon Haiyan devastated all the island of Cayango in Palau. And Carlos remembers that the typhoon incredible strong winds completely wiped out the whole island, forcing everyone from Cayango to relocate. So I'm so excited to learn from our speakers today. And our first speaker will be talking <clears throat> about ocean acidification and warming in the Pacific Islands. Um, some scientists call this topic the evil twin of climate change. So for our first speaker, we will have Jerwin Baure from the Philippines. <clears throat> okay, so uh, uh, the, uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me, guys? Okay. So, so... Today, uh, today I'm going to talk about ocean acidification and warming and its impacts on Pacific Islands. So, okay, so ocean acidification. So what is ocean acidification and why is it considered to be the, it's not. Sorry, hold on. <laughs> Is the presentation okay? What happened? Why is it on mute? There. Okay, so do you guys hear me? Can you hear? Okay. So what is ocean acidification and why is it considered to be the other CO2 problem? So in simpler terms, ocean acidification is a phenomenon in which our oceans become more acidic. However, technically it is uh, it refers to the lowering of the ocean's pH 
due to the increasing carbon dioxide concentration in the water. So that is why it is considered to be the evil twin of climate change because as, as the carbon dioxide in our atmosphere increases, the carbon dioxide in our seas also increases. And as you can see on the graph on the left, uh, it shows the trend of the increase of carbon dioxide in the past decades. And while on the right, it shows the, it, it also shows the trend of carbon dioxide on, on, on our oceans. And uh, the one on the, the blue lines, that, uh, that signifies the, the concentration of carbon dioxide, while the one on um, the green lines uh, signify the decrease in pH. So as carbon dioxide increases, the pH of our oceans uh, decreases. So with this, uh, we could see that climate change also affects our oceans and it manifests in the form of ocean acidification and warming. Additionally, scientists project that there would be an estimated increase in sea surface temperature and a decrease uh, for about two to four degrees Celsius, while there would be a decrease in pH at about 0.2 to 0.4. Um, this value or range might seem so small, but it actually has a big impact on our marine organisms. <clears throat> so how does so how does ocean acid so how does ocean acidification happen? So carbon dioxide from the atmosphere dissolves in seawater and forms carbonic acid, which turns the which turns our seas acidic. This so in that way the pH lowers. So excessive excessive amount of dissolved carbon dioxide in the sea can actually dissolve car, calcium calcium carbonate found in our corals. So, okay, next, okay. So, of course, uh, nature has a way of fighting climate change and our oceans play a vital role in doing that. So, an example for this is that our oceans are capable of trapping carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And this happens via photosynthesis of uh, many of marine plants, such as uh, seaweeds, uh, microscopic diatoms, seagrass, and mangroves. While on the other, on the other hand, uh, our oceans are also capable of absorbing heat from the atmosphere. Despite this, however, um, the ocean cannot keep up with the rate at, at, of how much uh, the atmospheric carbon dioxide and warming increases. So as a result, ocean acidification and warming happens. Next. Oh. So ocean acidification and warming pose threats on coral reef ecosystems. So so uh, we could say that this, this poses threats on our coral reefs and other marine ecosystems because uh, ocean acidification has the capability of dissolving the shells of many cal calcifying organisms. So example of these uh, organisms include corals, calcifying algae, uh, mollusks such as shells, uh, microscopic organisms such as coccolithophores and echinoderms such as uh, sea urchins. And meanwhile, um, other organisms that, that have no calcium carbonate, such as uh, seaweeds and diatoms, will, be, um, will flourish under these conditions. Okay, next. So here's an example of a scenario um, this is a study conducted by Hall Spencer in 2008. So as you can see on letter E, small organisms, uh, as you can see on uh, the organisms at the right left column, uh, letter A are uh, microscopic organisms in seagrasses, 
for letter C, that's uh, for letter C and letter E, that those are uh, marine snails. So as you can see, uh, under um, under favorable conditions, these organisms are able to flourish. However, um, under uh, under high concentrations of carbon dioxide, under acidic conditions and warm conditions, these organisms will either will either be lost or their shells will be uh, dissolved or become deformed. So another uh, manifestation of the effect of ocean acidification and warming will be the alteration of habitats. So when, so as I've mentioned earlier, uh, calcifying organisms are grow, optimally grow or rather, um, uh, calcifying organisms uh, grow under uh, favorable conditions that is low in acidity and ambient temperature. So that would be uh, on the left. However, if, uh, if our oceans continue to acidify and continue to warm, like the, uh, like the conditions under letter B in the middle portion, um, the, coral dom the once coral dominated ecosystem will shift into a, into a seaweed dominated ecosystem because seaweeds don't have calcium carbonate so they won't, uh, they won't dissolve under acidic conditions. And ultimately, if our oceans, if, uh, if ocean conditions worsen in the future and our oceans would be become more acidic and would become warmer, uh, seaweeds will eventually eventually die out and um, uh, the ultimate result will be uh, a dead ecosystem and what what will be left will be will only be coral rubble so another example of the effect of uh, ocean warming is that uh, fishes and other marine organisms would tend to migrate to cooler areas because uh, warmer waters won't be suitable for growth and reproduction. So they would tend to migrate and transfer to other locations. And wait, I'll just drink water. Okay, so, mm. so on the other hand, there, there's also this phenomenon called coral and giant plant bleaching. So bleaching occurs Bleaching occurs when corals and clams expel their symbiotic algae so when they are subjected under stress, making them ghostly white. So these symbiotic algae, as you can see on that giant clam, uh, it has green coloration. That's the algae. And if, if you've already seen a coral, the, 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 col the colors in the coral are actually uh, algae. So. So when, when, once once the corals and the and the clams are subjected under warm conditions, they would become more stressed. And when they're stressed, they would expel their algae, so they would lose their color. So if this occurs, they will starve, as these algae are actually their source of food. So and if they don't, uh, if and if they don't recover immediately, they would eventually die. So okay, so so here here's a map of some of the bleaching events in the world, and as you can see, many of them happen in the Pacific region. So example of that would be in Guam, Mariana Islands, Marshall Islands, uh, American Samoa, in, even in Hawaii, and and uh, probably uh, some of the worst uh, bleaching events occurred in Kiribati, Maldives, in the Indian Ocean and Great Barrier Reef in Australia. So here, I got this image earlier this morning from Coral Reef Watch. And right now, uh, as you can see, many areas around the world are subjected to threats of possible bleach bleaching events due to heat stress. So uh, you'd, 
as you can see, many regions in the Indian Ocean, in the Western Pacific, in the uh, in North in around South um, South America are currently under alerts level one, level alerts level two, and uh, that signifies that um, their areas are uh, has a threat of of having uh, bleaching events. And, and speaking of bleaching event, uh, there's an ongoing bleaching event in Australia. And this news actually was actually reported yesterday. And it is said that this bleaching event is second to the, is only second when it comes to um, its intensity compared to the, the event in 2016 when about one third of the coral reefs in, in the Great Barrier Reef in Australia have died. So, so this phenomena, ocean acidification and warming, warming, may lead to the degradation of our, of our coral reefs if not properly addressed immediately. And as a result, the degradation of reefs will make many coastal communities vulnerable to climate-related hazards. So for example, healthy reefs can buffer strong waves during storms. However, with degraded reefs, coastal communities won't be having uh, the same protection as healthy coral reefs provide because uh, degraded reefs would be weaker, so they would be less efficient in buffering strong waves during storms. And furthermore, the degradation of reefs will, in, will endanger our food security as reefs are, since reefs provide shelter for many economically important fishery resources. So, so in summary, in summary um, degraded reefs would lead to, would make coastal communities more vulnerable by exposing them to more hazards such as strong waves and during calamities, people won't be having enough food. So what must be done? So of course, first, we must demand for a system change. We must urge world, leader, world leaders, especially those coming from highly industrialized countries, to reduce their carbon emissions. We must also seek accountability from multinational companies operating in developing countries. And ultimately, we must all strive to defend our environment. And with that, I would like to thank all of you for listening to my very short presentation. Uh, you may follow us at our social media accounts. And special thanks to Yakap Youth, for Youth Advocates for Climate Action in the Philippines for inviting us to speak here. Thank you very much. <laughs> I can't hear you. <laughs> thank you so much for that, Jerwin. Thank you for teaching us about marine ecosystems and how it's affecting, how climate change is affecting um, our oceans and how it's also affecting our people. So now, Carlos, can you tell us about the impacts that you have seen in your life and experience as a climate activist? Can you repeat that question again? If you can tell us, you know, your um, the impacts that you, you have seen in your life and ex your experience as a climate activist. Okay, so yeah, so climate change has had a lot, of, like a lot of impacts, especially to us small island nations, and Palau, along with other small island nations in Micronesia, we are at the forefront and we are the most vulnerable countries to be affected by climate change as we are experiencing it now firsthand and the climate crisis is real and it's not a fear of a distant fear we're experiencing it now and we're living into it and yeah as small island nations we we don't have that much to offer to the world but all we have is our environment and our culture um because Palau depends on its ocean a lot. So without it, there wouldn't be us because it is our land 
and and seas that brings tourists from different places around the world and also it brings people together and our ocean is our main source of food and our main source of income and climate change is basically slowly killing our reefs and the beautiful corals that many tourists from different places around the world travel thousands of miles just to come and visit to see our pristine paradise to see how beautiful and diverse our oceans are but also climate change is also affecting many communities there it's forcing many families to move out of their houses because they're vulnerable to rise of sea level and losing a home is not that easy because that's where your foundation is that's where your your parents parents have lived in but it's just hard because losing a home is not really it's heartbreaking to be honest because now you have to start from the beginning again but as time goes on like scientists say we only have 11 years basically before we reach the, the point of no return it is our right as children and as people to have a livable sustainable planet on which we can build our lives in. Like, we don't deserve to be stopped from everything that we have. Like, we want to live how our parents, how our grandparents have lived before. We deserve nothing less. And the climate is our fight for our lives, basically. And this entire movement is bigger than any of us. We're not doing this because we want to, just for fame, just for fun. We're doing it because we have to. This is our future that depends on it. And if we don't do anything, then who will like, who will do it for us? Who will give us a better future? And this time, it's basically us youths trying to save our future, not just for us, but also for our future generation. And I just want to ask that I hope each and every country should step up to the plate and act on this now because a small island nation like Palau can take all this by itself because we're small and we're not that developed. Like we all have to work together because we live in the same planet and we are experiencing climate, climate change and climate crisis. And it's not that if it's not that if you're not being affected by it now, you're not going to do anything. It's your actions. That's why small island Pacific, like small island nations like us are suffering. We're experiencing it now. Like there's no there's no point of you not doing anything because every small change makes a difference. And if you start now, we still have a chance to have an island to live in. And if we decide to work together, we can avoid a complete climate catastrophe and live a phosphorus and fulfilling adulthood. Thank you. Well, thank you, Carlos, for your amazing and powerful words. It's such an amazing to have you here and sharing you, your experience. Amazing. Now we will be having the question and answer part. We have a few questions from the YouTube live chat, and we have some from um, surveys from before. So our first question is for the both speakers. Um, so... In different parts of the world, we are seeing how global leaders have different responses to climate change. Some are not believing in it at all. Some are ignoring it. A lot are, are, a lot are not listening to the science. What has your government done with regards to climate change? And are they supportive of the climate movement? Uh, Carlos, you can go ahead if you want. OK. so. Yeah, the government of Palau is trying its best to basically tackle this climate crisis because every little change matters. And Palau is trying to move toward the use of clean energy as it aims to generate 45% of its energy from renewable resources by 2025. And as our president said, President Ramosao, he said, we're definitely promoting renewable energy even though we contribute the least to the cost of climate change. 
we hope that by doing so, our developed partners at least understand that we're doing something in a small scale, but we are addressing the very problem that develops countries are contributing to the emissions of harmful gases in our atmosphere. And at the same time, Palau is also into conservation and Palau set up the world's first national sanctu shark sanctuary in 2015. And it designated 80% of its maritime territory as a full protective marine reserve, which means no fishing is allowed with 80% of Palau's waters. How about for you in the Philippines, Derwin? So, hi, so actually here in the, in the Philippines, we have many good environmental laws. We have, we have signed uh, many international agreements. However, um, in the government, there are still a lot of contra contradictions. So uh, an example of that contradiction is that um, uh, many environmental laws in the Philippines uh, provide protection to a lot of endangered species, to a lot of uh, uh, protected areas. However, uh, the Department of Environment and Natural, Natural Resources itself is being too lenient on, pro on the projects of different corporations that, uh, that have adverse effects to the environment. So an example of that would be the Manila Bay Reclamation, the uh, continuous operation of many coal-fired power plants, which are mostly foreign-owned, and then um, also the approved the uh, continuous operation of large-scale mining. And at the same time, um, the government itself is uh, the, uh, the perpetrator for uh, the killing of many environmental defenders, such as uh, uh, environmentalists, indigenous peoples, and other uh, citizens. Amazing. Although we have a question for both of you, and the question is, both Palau and the Philippines were heavily affected by the Typhoon Haiyan back in 2013. What were your experiences there? Maybe you, maybe Erwin, you can start to change the. I mean, uh, so for me personally, I haven't experienced uh, the full, the full blown effect of Typhoon Haiyan, locally known as Typhoon Yolanda here in the Philippines, because uh, I live in that part of the Philippines, which is quite uh, sheltered from winds and uh, and storm. However based on the news I've read, uh, a lot of people have lost their lives in Eastern Samar, uh, in Eastern Visayas and uh, Northern Panay. And there are, however, uh, the beauty in this, uh, not really beauty, but um, in, this, uh, in this disaster or in this calamity, we have proven that, uh, that environmental protection should, also, should always be uh, should always be uh, prioritized because uh, it was found out that communities that have a healthy mangrove ecosystem were found to be uh, saved from the wrath of Typhoon Haiyan. Yeah, just like Jerwin, like during that, during Typhoon Haiyan, like we weren't severely hit because the typhoon didn't really pass by the, the central. But as far from what I heard is that the typhoon devastatedly that like destroyed the whole island where some families were forced to relocate to other places to start a new life. But as time goes on, they start to recover and just like build things back from ground up basically. Um, for from the YouTube live chat, we have a question for Jerwin. What impacts does acidification have on plankton? On what? On plankton. Plan plankton? Ah, okay. So plankton, as I've said earlier, uh, um, they have the ab ability to uh, to utilize the carbon dioxide during photosynthesis. So. Um, I, my start, my undergraduate, uh, my graduate thesis here at uh, UPMSI is actually focused on the effect of ocean acidification on on benthic diatoms. So, based on literature, um, 
many studies suggest that uh, plan plankton may actually uh, benefit from uh, the increased amount of dissolved carbon dioxide in, in our oceans. Wait, let me just add that, let me just add that, uh, although several literatures suggest that plankton may, uh, may benefit from ocean acidification, there are also studies that show that some species uh, may actually, um, uh, the effect of ocean acidification on uh, plankton will be uh, species specific, meaning some species will benefit, some, spe some species will, uh, will uh, ocean acidification will be detrimental to other species. Amazing. This question is also from YouTube and it's for both of you. How dangerous is climate activism in Philippines and Palau given the illiberal governments there? Can you repeat that question? Yeah. How dangerous is climate activism in Philippines and Palau, given the illiberal governments there? Yeah, so being a climate activist is not really like dangerous here in Palau because the youth supports what you're doing because this is our fight. The youths should be heard. It's our time to be heard. And also, the government's also in support of some climate movement, basically, because we're all working towards the betterment of our planet. And it's going to be hard because we're a small island nation, but we're trying our best to change and contribute, just like help a little, basically. Like we want to contribute even though it's a little change because little change can lead to bigger changes. Sherwin, for the Philippines. So, so in, uh, in the previous year, I was involved with uh, the campaign against Manila, Manila Bay Reclamation, specifically um, against the construction of Bulacan Eretropolis uh, in Bulacan, uh, in the Bulacan province in Luzon. So, so the Bulacan Eretropolis is uh, being sponsored by San Miguel Corporation. It's a um, multi. It's a. It's a company famous for its uh, beverages. So, uh, San Miguel plans to create um, uh, to reclaim about two thousand five hundred hectares of mangroves uh, of of the of the sea of the coastal area and uh, include and uh, including several patches of mangroves there. So they're planning to cut down. Uh, they've already cut down mangrove 600 trees in 2018. So uh, in the previous year, I was involved in the, the campaign against that, uh, that airport. And by the end of 2019, I was um, um, the, the military, um, the military was, uh, there was a deployment of the military there. And they've, they've been telling the, the fisher folk to not let the, to not let us in. Uh, because we ha because they say that we are uh, recruiting them for something illegal or or other activities uh, not allowed by the uh, by the government. So uh, it it's it's very dangerous for us because uh, we are we are just uh, uh, volunteer scientists. We are just helping fisher folk to defend mangrove forests. But um, but the government answers us with. Uh, um, fascism. Yeah, uh, they they're they're harassing fisher folk. They're harassing environmentalists. That sounds really horrible. Um, especially since we know that these people are the frontliners in the struggle for our environment. Um, for you, Carlos, are there similar are there similar experiences like this in Palau or? Um, are there people who are more vulnerable to the effects of climate change? And how do you think we can help those that are more vulnerable to the impacts of climate change? Um, not like a similar experience to Jerwin, but like 
for us, it's more of like, it's really open because it's really small. Like we're, our population is not that big, but for us to help those people who are really vulnerable to this climate crisis, I guess the best thing we could do is to spread awareness and to educate people because through education and awareness comes the great passion for change, basically. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. Erwin, this question is for you. Is, is ocean acidification reversible? Can we do anything about to slow it down? Um, well, I'm not really sure about its reversibility, but I'm sure that we can slow it down if we reduce our carbon emissions because um, um, throughout, actually throughout geologic history, uh, as we all know, carbon, uh, atmospheric carbon has fluctuated throughout the geologic, his the, the very long geologic history and uh, it's a natural event. However, what's currently happen happening now is that its rate of increase is uh, uh, becoming faster due to uh, higher carbon emissions by humans. So I believe that in order in order to lessen the impact to slow down ocean acidification, we, we must reduce our carbon emissions. Next question is, um, how has the bleaching, how is, has coral reef bleaching affected your communities or communities in your area for any of you? Mm, I haven't. I haven't uh, witnessed a massive bleaching event so far, but uh, there are there are actually news uh, in the past few few years that bleaching events have occurred in the Philippines, but they're they're not as massive or as worse as what what's currently happening in the Great Barrier Reef. How about in Palau? Are there any events like that? Um. Yeah, similar to him, I haven't experienced anything about it. And here in Palau, we haven't experienced a major coral bleaching since 1998 and 1999. But there are some occurrences of some minor bleaching. But as far as I've been here, I haven't experienced a major coral bleaching. So, yeah. Amazing. Carlos, how did you get involved in the climate movement? Oh yeah, so I got involved in the climate climate movement because when I started to see the change, like the the place that I that I fell in love with, the place that I call home, when I saw it, it started to change. I was just more I was curious about why is this happening and everything. And th during my freshman year of high school, I decided to join the organization Air Star Ocean to learn more about the effects of climate change, plastic pollution, and how all these things connects and becomes this bigger thing. And like throughout my whole journey, like I didn't know what I was doing until I decided to like do this as my passion to really do it with love and to just know about everything that's going on just to protect the place that I love, the place that I call home, because I don't wanna lose this place because this place is a pristine paradise. Like there's no other place like this in the, in the, in the world, basically. Carlos, um, so with that, what things have you done in the climate, with the climate movement? Uh, you are one of the 16 child petitioners. I, if I remember correctly, could you tell us yeah. more about that? Oh yeah, so that was the more most recent event that I've attended where I became one of the 16 child petitioners who filed a complaint to the United Nations Committee of the Rights of a Child in back at back in September of 2019, where we filed a complaint against the five biggest countries who contributes more to the greenhouse gases, where we demanded the United Nations to basically lead the way to give us kids, us child, us children, basically, for a better life to live in, a better planet and a better place for us to be in, basically. Thank you. 
Okay, um, this is for Erwin. Given that Australia has experienced more bleaching events already, what can what lessons can we be taking away from this from other regions, like for example, coral restoration and etc. Et cetera? <laughs> um, I'm not really an expert on coral res restoration, but I believe that. Um, let me formulate my answer. Um, uh, can you repeat the question? Yeah, sure. Given, the given that Australia has experienced more bleaching events already, what lessons can be taken away from this from other regions? So there, uh, as uh, I think the lesson here is that we must um, uh, we must be, we must uh, intensify our efforts in, in, rest in the restoration of our coral reefs and we must conduct research, we must, uh, the government must uh, give uh, full support to our scientists so that um, our reefs will become more resilient towards this, uh, this phenomenon. Carlos, so you mentioned earlier that um, one of the things that got you started in the climate movement was you were seeing how there were changes in Palau. Can you tell us about those changes and how um, how you felt about them and why you think they were happening? Like, did you understand it right away when you saw them or did you um, have to look into it and research it some more? Yeah, basically when I saw those changes, I was kind of confused. I'm like, oh, I guess this how the world is. Like it changes once in a while. But as time goes on, I'm like, I, as I get older, I start to see changes that I'm like, wait, no, these are not normal changes. So being an, being part of the Air Star Ocean basically started me on ba like just to look deeper on the effects and like, why is this things happening? So before I used to spend the whole day at the beach, just swimming, having fun with the, my friends and family. But as time goes on, the beach where we used to play is getting smaller and smaller. So I'm like, oh, is, is, it, is this normal or what? Well, then I started learning about the rise of sea level. And also like when you go in the, in the ocean and swim, the water is kind of a, li a little bit hotter than, a little bit hotter than how it used to be. So I also looked into basically rice and sea temperature and everything. And before I also played basketball with my friends outside and just basically just walk around. But now it's just too hot to basically just be outside. So those events kind of led me to just basically doing more research and finding the answers. Why are these things happening in our world? And what are the things we could do to just basically help our planet for like to be a better planet for us to be in. Amazing. Thank you. This question goes to Darwin. Why it is so important to take care of the blue carbon ecosystems, carbon sink like mangroves, corals, reefs, etc. Aside from the climate change impacts, what trends this this ecosystem? So, um, so it, it is very important to take, to take care of our marine ecosystems such as uh, mangroves, seagrasses, because these ecosystems have uh, the capability of absorbing uh, uh, carbon dioxide from the, atmosphere, from the atmosphere. And in fact, they, have, they are more efficient than, than, uh, than tropical rainforest, even though mangroves occupy a very small niche in the world as compared to rainforests, they, they are able to, um, to absorb more carbon dioxide. So aside from, and additionally, um, if, these, if these ecosystems such as mangroves are, uh, are cut down, um, I've read this paper about, uh, uh, about a review paper and it says that um, that when mangroves are cut down, carbon dioxide is released into the atmosphere, and 
uh, and and the sediments on which these mangroves uh, thrive will also release uh, carbon into the atmosphere once the sediments oxidize. So if a large amount, a large uh, area of mangroves are cut down, uh, you would only imagine how much uh, carbon dioxide will be released to, uh, to the atmosphere. So uh, aside from um, Aside from climate change, other uh, other threats to our mangrove ecosystem and seagrass ecosystems would be uh, coastal development because um, our uh, many government uh, our governments are um, trying to develop many coastal areas, and that would entail uh, the that would entail reclamation, that is uh, dumping of soil into into these ecosystems, and as I've mentioned earlier. Uh, the Philippine government, together with San Miguel Corporation, is planning to cut down, uh, to cut down and reclaim an area of about 2,500 hectares of mangroves in Bulacan, in, nor in northern Man Manila Bay. So that's really that would have a, a very huge impact to our eco, not only to to our uh, environment, but also to many coastal communities. Uh, along the area, as well as um, its effect on food security, because um, Manila Bay actually is one of the most productive uh, regions, fishing grounds in the Philippines. So, uh, once these uh, ecosystems are destroyed, uh, the production of fishes will be affected. Carlos, um, so we're all from the global south here uh, Philippines, Palau, and Central America. Um, so I think we can all relate that effects on the, on the climate can make us really sad. So are you, have you experienced anything like that, like climate anxiety, or um, since it's something that's actually also happening, not just in Global South, but in a lot of countries, that um, a lot of youth are getting um, anxious about the climate and about their future, and they're lost on what to do, and they don't know um, how to deal with these things, and some are having burnout because of the climate activism. Do you have any advice or thoughts on that? Basically, just my advice to all those kids is basically just do what you love to do and protect what you what you love, basically. And I guess, yeah, it's it's sad that like we're trying to worry about our planet because we're so young. We should be enjoying what kids do, basically. But we're here right now trying to protect our planet for our future and basically for us to have a future. and. Yeah, overall, just do what you love, keep doing what you're doing, and just protect the places that you love, the place that you call home, the place that basically where you have fun. Thank you. Do you have any other inspiring messages for the youth and why, what you think their role is in tackling climate change? Oh, yeah. So... Yeah, the youths are basically the voices of our future. Like we are advocating for a safer environment and a safer home for us to live in. And we have to speak up basically for our rights and for our future. And we have to step up and be the leader in this global in this global movement that we're facing right now. And it's hard because we all deserve a home that's not sinking, a home that's not polluted. But as, as far as I know, we have the voice to be heard, but we don't have the power to make those changes. Our role is basically to spread awareness and educate others because through education and awareness comes the great passion to do a lot of changes. Thank you so much for that. That was so inspiring. Thank you. <laughs> that was amazing to be honest also uh, last question this is for you Erwin and what is the role of the scientists especially from the Pacific nations in tackle the, cl the climate change can you give us any mm -hmm. inspiring messages so I think the role of scientists here is aside from conducting research on uh, related to climate to the climate condition is that we must use our science properly to actively campaign 
for the reduction of carbon emissions and for our system change. And we must use our science to, def to debunk false information being peddled by um, scientists backed by cor corporations. Because, um, and I believe that um, as scientists, our, our science must be used for the interest of the people, for the interest of the environment, and not for the interest of of the the very few elites who are responsible for the destruction of our environment and that uh, our science must be used to serve the people. That was so inspiring. Of course, we should always make sure that in any field we're doing, we're always remembering the people and we're serving the people. Um, thank you so much to our speakers. If Do you guys have any final messages that you want to tell us or the audience? Okay. Wait, wait, Thank you, you so much. Oh, okay. Oh, you, is there, there any final um, messages that you want to tell the world, the people uh, watching oh, tonight? The world. So I think um, there are. I think we must uh, incur, We must be get ourselves involved. Um, especially, uh, we must not be. Uh, we must not be detached from society. We we must not isolate ourselves from from society. Um, uh, as citizens of the world, we must um, actively campaign for the betterment of the world. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much to both our speakers. And thank you to everyone watching this today. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you, Jerwin. Thank you, Carlos. And we will see you next Friday for our next Talks for Future. Thank you. Thank you for thank joining you. us. Thank you, for, thank you for being here today. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, guys.